History of the United States prepared especially for schools on a new and comprehensive plan embracing the features of Lyman's historical chart by John Clark Ridpath, LLD. Grammar School Edition, illustrated with charts, maps, portraits, sketches, and diagrams. Jones Brothers and Company, entered according to the Act of Congress in the year 1876 by John T. Jones in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington. Preface. I offer to American boys and girls a new history of their country. My hope has been to make them love the inspiring story. In the preparation of this little book, the following objects have been kept in view. 1. To give an accurate and spirited narrative of the principal events in our country's history from the discovery of America to present time. Two, to present a clear and systematic arrangement of the several subjects, giving to every fact, whether of peace or war, its true place and proportion in the narrative. Three, to give an objective representation by means of charts, maps, and drawings of all the important facts of our history. Four, to employ such a style and method as seen best adapted to fix the attention of the student and to awaken his enthusiasm. Whether I have succeeded in this work, it is not mine to decide. If success has not rewarded the effort, the failure has been in the execution rather than in the plan and purpose. I surrender this new grammar school history of the United States to those for whose benefit it was begun and has been finished. I ask of teacher and student a just recognition of whatever worth the work may be found to possess and a charitable criticism of its defects. JCR, Indiana Asbury University, January 1st, 1882. Introduction. There are five periods in the history of the United States. It is important for the student to understand these at the beginning. Without such an understanding, his notion of our country's history will be confused and his study rendered difficult. 2. First of all, there was a time when the Western continent was under dominion of the Red Men. The savage races possessed the soil, hunted in the forest, roamed over the prairies. This is the aboriginal period of American history. 3. After the discovery of America, the people of Europe were for a long time engaged in exploring the New World and in making themselves familiar with its shape and character. For more than a hundred years, curiosity was the leading passion with the adventurers who came to our shores. Their disposition was to go everywhere and settle nowhere. These early times may be called the period of voyage and discovery. Four. Next came the time of planting colonies. The adventurers, tired of wandering about, became anxious to found new states in the wilderness. Kings and queens turned their attention to the work of colonizing the New World. Thus arose a third period, the period of colonial history. The colonies grew strong and multiplied. There were thirteen little seashore republics. The rulers of the mother country began a system of oppression and tyranny. The colonies revolted, fought side by side, and won their freedom. Not satisfied with mere independence, they built them a union strong and great. This is the period of revolution and confederation. Then the United States entered upon a career as a nation, three times tried by war and many times vexed with civil dissensions. The union established by our fathers still remains for us and for posterity. 7. Collecting these results we find in the history of our country. First, the aboriginal period from remote antiquity to the coming of the white men. Second, the period of voyage and discovery, A.D. 986 to 1607. Third, the colonial period, A.D. 1607 to 1775. Fourth, 
the period of revolution and confederation, A.D. 1775 and 1789. Fifth, the national period, A.D. 1789 to 1882. In this order, the history of the United States will be presented in the following pages. History of the United States, Part 1, Aboriginal America. Chapter 1, The Red Men. The primitive inhabitants of the New World were the Red Men called Indians. The name Indian was given to them from their supposed identity with the people of India. Columbus and his followers believed that they had reached the islands of the Far East and that the natives were of the same race with the inhabitants of the Indies. The mistake of the Spaniards was soon discovered. But the name Indian has ever since remained to designate the native tribes of the Western continent. The origin of the Indians is involved in obscurity. At what date or by what route they came to the New World is unknown. The notion that the Red Men are descendants of the Israelites is absurd. The Europeans or Africans at some early period crossed the Atlantic by sailing from island to island seems improbable. That the people of Kamchatka came by way of Bering Strait into the northwestern parts of America has little evidence to support it. Perhaps a more thorough knowledge of the Indian languages may yet throw some light on the origin of the race. Three. The Indians belonged to the bow and arrow family of men. To the red men, the chase was everything. Without the chase, he languished and died. To smite the deer and the bear was his chief delight and profit. Such a race could live only in a country of woods and wild animals. Four, the northern parts of America were inhabited by the Esquima. The name means the eaters of raw meat. They lived in snow huts or hovels. Their manner of life was that of fishermen and hunters. They clad themselves in the winter with the skins of seals, and in the summer with those of reindeers. The greater portion of the United States east of the Mississippi was peopled by the family of the Algonquins. They were divided into many tribes, each having its local name and tradition. Agriculture was but little practiced by them. They roamed about from one hunting ground and river to another. When the white men came, the Algonquin nations were already declining in numbers and influence. Only a few thousands now remained. Around the shores of Lake Erie and Ontario lived the Huron Iroquois. At the, time of, at the time of their greatest power, they embraced no fewer than nine nations. The warriors of this confederacy presented the Indian character in its best aspect. They were brave, patriotic, and eloquent, faithful as friends, but terrible as enemies. 7. South of the Algonquins were the Cherokees and the Mobilian nations. The former were highly civilized for a primitive people. The principal tribes of the Mobilians were the Yamasis and the Creeks of Georgia, the Seminoles of Florida, and the Choctaws and Chickasaws of Mississippi. These displayed the usual disposition and habits of the Redmen. West of the Mississippi was the family of the Dakotas. South of these, in a district near, nearly corresponding the state of Texas, lived the wild Comanches. Beyond the Rocky Mountains were the Indian nations of the Plains, the great families of the Smoshanese, the Selish, the Klamaths, and the Californians. On the Pacific Slope, farther southward, dwelt in former times the civilized but feeble race of Aztecs. The Red Men had a great passion for war. Their wars were undertaken for revenge rather than conquest. To forgive an injury was considered a shame. Revenge was the noblest of virtues. To open, the open battle of field was an unknown in Indian warfare. Fighting was limited to the ambuscade and the massacre. Quarter was rarely asked and never granted. In times of peace, Indian character appeared to a better advantage. But the red man was always unsocial and solitary. He sat by himself in the wood. The forest was better than a wigwam, and the wigwam better than a village. The Indian women 
The Indian woman was de a degraded creature, a mere drudge and beast of burden. In the matter of the arts, the Indian was a barbarian. His house was a hovel, built of poles set up in a circle and covered with skins and branches of trees. Household utensils were few and rude. Earthen pots, bags, and pouches for carrying provisions and stone hammers for pounding corn were the stock and store. His weapons of offense and defense were the hatchet and the bow of arrow. In times of war, the red man painted his face and body in all manner of glaring colors. The fine arts were wanting. Indian writing consisted of half-intelligible hieroglyphics scratched on a face of rocks or cut in the bark of trees. The Indian languages bear little resemblance to those of other races. The red man's vocabulary was very limited. The principal objects of nature had special names, but abstract ideas could hardly be expressed. Indian words had intense meanings, very intense meaning. There was, for instance, no word signifying to hunt or to fish, but one word signified to kill a deer with an arrow, another to take a fish by striking the ice. Among some of the tribes, the meaning of words was so restricted that the warrior would use one term and the squaw another to express the same idea. The Indians were generally serious in manners and behavior. Sometimes, however, they gave themselves up to merrymaking and hilarity. The dance was universal, not the social dance of civilized nations, but the solemn dance of religion and of war. Gaming was much practiced among all the tribes. Other amusements were common, such as running, wrestling, shooting at a mark, and racing in canoes. In personal appearance, the Indians were strongly marked. In stature, they were below the average of Europeans. The Esquimaux are rarely five feet high. The Algonquins are taller and lighter in build, straight and agile, lean and swift of foot. The eyes are jet black and sunken, hair black and straight, skin copper color or brown, hands and feet small, body lithe, but not strong, expression sinister and sometimes dignified and noble. The best hopes of the Indian race seem now to center in the Choctaws, Cherokees, Creeks, and Chickasaws of the Indian Territory. These nations have attained a considerable degree of civilization. Most of the other tribes are declining in numbers and influence. Whether the Indians have been justly deprived of the New World will remain a subject of debate, but they have been deprived can be none. That they have been deprived can be none. The white races have taken possession of the vast domain, to the prairies and forests, the hunting grounds of his fathers. The red man says farewell. Recapitulation. The name Indian, origin of the race, considered not Israelites, not Europeans. Devotion of the Indians to the chase, the Esquimaux, their position and habits, the Algonquins, their character, the Huron Iroquois, Cherokees and Mobilians, the Dakotas, races of the West, Indian principles of war, disposition and peace, Indian arts, implements, writing, language, manners and customs, personal appearance, decline of the race. Part 2. Voyage and Discovery. A.D. 986-1607 to Chapter 2. The Icelanders and Norwegians in America The western continent was first seen by white men in A.D. 986. A Norse navigator by the name of Herjolfsson Sailing from Iceland to Greenland was caught in a storm and driven westward to Newfoundland or Labrador. Two or three times the shores were seen, but no landing was made or attempted. The coast was low, abounding in forests, and so different from the well-known cliffs of Greenland, as to make it certain that another shore hitherto unknown was in sight. On reaching Greenland, Hergelson and his companions took wonderful stories of the new land seen in the west. Fourteen years later, the actual discovery of America was made by Leif Erikson. 
resolving to know the truth about the country which Hergelson had seen. He sailed westward from Greenland and in the spring of the year 1001 reached Labrador Landing. Labrador Landing with his companions, he made the explorations for a considerable distance along the coast. The country was milder and more attractive than his own, and he was in no haste to return. Southward he went as far as Massachusetts, where the company remained for more than a year. Rhode Island was also visited. And it is alleged that the adventurers found their way into the New York Harbor. In the years that followed Leif Erikson's discovery, other companies of Norsemen came to the shores of America. Thorwald, Leif's brother, made a voyage to Maine and Massachusetts in 1002, and is said to have died at Fall River in the latter state. Then another brother, Thorstein by name, arrived with a band of followers in 1005, and in the year 1007, Thorfinn Karlsfinn and the most distinguished mariner of his days came with a crew of 150 men and made explorations along the coast of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and perhaps as far south as the Capes of Virginia. Other companies of Icelanders and Norwegians visited the countries farther north and planted colonies in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Little, however, was known or imagined by these rude sailors of the extent of the country which they had discovered. They supposed that it was only a portion of western Greenland, which, bending to the north around an arm of the ocean, had reappeared in the west. The settlements which were made were feeble and soon broken up. Commerce was an impossibility in a country where there were only a few wretched savages with no disposition to buy and nothing at all to sell. The spirit of venture was soon appeased, and the restless Northmen returned to their own country. To this undefined line of coast, now vaguely known to them, the Norse sailors gave the name of Vinland. During the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, Occasional voyages were made, and as late as A.D. 1347, a Norwegian ship visited Labrador and the northeastern parts of the United States. In 1350, Greenland and Vinland were depopulated by a great plague, which had spread thither from Norway. From that time forth, communication with the New World ceased, and the history of the Northmen in America was at an end. The North's remains which have been found at Newport, at Fall River, and several other places, point clearly to the events here narrated, and the Icelandic historians give a consistent account of those early exploits of their countrymen. When the word America is mentioned in the hearing of the schoolboys of England, they will at once answer with enthusiasm, Oh yes, Leif Erikson discovered that country in the year 1001. An event is to be weighed by its consequences. From the discovery of America by the Norsemen, nothing whatever resulted. The world was neither wiser nor better. Among the Icelanders themselves, the place and the very name of Vinland was forgotten, were forgotten. Europe never heard of such a country or such a discovery. Historians have until late years been incredulous on the subject. And the fact is, as though it had never been. The curtain, which had been lifted for a moment, was stretched again from sky to sea, and the new world still lay hidden in the shadows. Recapitulation. Hergelson is driven by a storm to the American coast. Leif Erikson discovers America. Thorwald and Thorstein Erikson make voyages. Thorfinn Karlsfinn explores the shores of Maine and Massachusetts. Other voyages are made by the Norsemen. Communication with the New World is broken off by the plague. Nothing practical results from the Icelandic discoveries.